Bible readers today have the benefit of easy access to printed copies of the Bible at modest prices. Many, of course, many of you here tonight would have access to it through as, as a digital copy of, of the Bible on a computer or a tablet or a phone. But the widespread access to the Bible, the full text of God's word that we are so familiar with, is in fact a relatively recent phenomenon, a development really of the last 200 years. Until well after the invention of movable type in the 15th century, until well after that, very few people had access to a physical copy of the Bible. Largely because they couldn't afford it, but also until relatively recent times, like the last 200 years, most people were still illiterate. So even if they could afford it, what was the point of having a copy? The scriptures, however, were written in such a way that they are memorable to the servants of God, most of whom, in fact, down the ages, have not had access to their own personal copy of the Bible. They've only had access to the Word of God through hearing it read or recited. And even today, not so much in this country, obviously, but in the mission fields, there are illiterate brothers and sisters who well understand their Bible because they listen to it, they hear it, and they remember it. And it's not by accident that that's the case. It is a deliberate part of God's design that the text is heavy with literary techniques and motifs that are designed to make an impression on the hearers, to help the word lodge in their memories and enhance retention of its message. And we have a reminder of that time on the title pages of most editions of the authorised version of the Bible. If you have an authorised version in front of you, it probably has that, some, a title page, something like that, with those words appointed to be read in churches. It was the intention of those responsible in the 17th century for the authorised version that it be available in every church in the land so that men and women who were illiterate and or too poor to have their own copy could go to the church and hear the word of God read aloud. That was their intention, and hence that's what that word, those words mean. It's not about whether other versions are allowed. That was the intention, the legal intention of the time when the king commissioned the authorised version. And so with that in mind, the translators deliberately crafted their translation using rhythms and cadences designed to make the text memorable. And you will notice this that even brethren who today might use a modern translation for their personal Bible reading, if they quote scripture in prayer, it almost always they will default to the authorised version because it's lodged and it lodges in our brain more readily because it was designed to do so. Now at a higher level than that of the translators, the writers of Bible books were inspired to employ figures of speech and word patterns and recurring motifs so that it would help the readers remember what they'd heard and connected to other parts of the Bible. And you'll recall the frequent phrase of our Lord in uh, his disputes with the religious rulers in his day, where he said to them, have ye never read? And of course he was being sarcastic, because these were men who'd memorised the whole of the old, what we would now call the Old Testament. They could recite it from Genesis to Malachi but they never read it, they never understood it, it was the point he was making. But the fact that they could memorise it was a reflection of the way God had written it, so that it could be memorised, and that it would lodge and be part of your psyche, and it would come to float around in your mind and be easily recalled. And that was achieved by using these recurring figures of speech and word patterns and motives. And attending even today, attentive readers and hearers of the Bible notice those patterns and they use it to con those repetition of themes and images and they make connections between different sections of scripture. And some of you, when you've, if you've been involved in delivering the How to Read the Bible seminars, will recall that in some versions they used to have a session called Bible Echoes, which was picking up this idea. We need to develop minds that are and consciences that are tuned to those patterns 
so that they do lodge. And when they do, we will recognise the motive of the tree of life as one of these things that keeps coming up throughout the word of God. And as we see the, the tree of life motive come up, the principles associated with it that our brother referred to in his prayer tonight, as they're worked out in scripture, will enhance our appreciation of the gospel and, our, and of the way of the Lord, the way of the tree of life. And it will help us to focus on the reality and substance of the new creation in Christ, of which, of course, the Adamic creation is but the shadow. Now, I'd like you to open your Bible, please, at Genesis chapter 3, where we read of the way of the tree of life. I think the tree of life may be presumed to have held a central place, or the way of the tree of life may be presumed to have held a central place in the religious devotions of Adam and Eve's descendants, at least in the line of Seth, perhaps until the time of Noah. They would have assembled there for worship. Verses 22 to 24 of Genesis 3. The Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil, and now let, lest he put forth his hand, and take also of the tree of life, and eat, and live for ever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. The verb there is important. To keep the way of the tree of life. It does not say to bar. It says to keep. And what do you keep? You keep things that matter. You keep things that are valuable. You keep things that you value. Uh, Brother Lane Ritby has sought to illustrate in this image, which he kindly allowed me to reproduce, uh, what is sort of being spoken about in those verses, a sort of a visual image of what's being talked about, what he calls the proto-tabernacle at, at uh, Eden. And the cherubim were there to keep the way of the tree of life. That is, they were to prevent unauthorised access to the tree, Adam couldn't just go and eat of it and live forever, as it says in verse 22. But they were to preserve and to protect the way of the tree of life, to ensure that those who would be granted the right to eat of it could do so at the appointed time when God determined that that was right. And we read of that, of course, in Revelation, don't we? Of the right to eat of the tree of life that will be granted to the faithful. As we read through Genesis... It is curious, I think, how many special trees are mentioned in the text. You may not have thought about this before, but it's actually a real feature of the record that there are these references to special trees sprinkled throughout the Genesis record. And I think they're there because it reflects the yearning of the patriarchs for the restoration of Eden, the restoration of access to the tree of life, for the reversal of the curse of sin and death. Come over, please, to chapter 6 of Genesis, where we have the, our first reference to a tree, in this case timber, outside the Garden of Eden. Perhaps it was before the cherubim, at the east of the garden, that Noah learnt that he was to build an ark for the saving of himself and his family. Now, whether that's so or not, Noah may have been conscious that when he received that command about the ark, he may have been conscious of the tree of life. The objective, of course, of that ark was defined in Hebrews as being the saving of his house, which of course is what access to the tree of life is all about. And so we read in Genesis 6 and verses 13 and 14, and God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood, room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. This is the only reference in scripture to gopher wood. Uh, I don't think you'll have any other translations. In any other translation, I don't think there would be any other form because this is the only reference to it. And indeed, it's just a transliteration of the Hebrew word, gopher. Obviously, the translators had no idea what the timber was. 
So it's impossible to be dogmatic about the identity of the timber of the species. <coughs> but most scholars think it's highly likely that the word refers to a resinous timber, and that some of the, the etymology of that word suggests this. A resinous timber such as you have with cypress or cedar, one of those very sappy resinous timbers. And we know that cypress was widely used in shipbuilding in the ancient Middle East because of its toughness and its close grain texture. It was highly effective as a boat building timber. Now, if the consensus view about the identity of Goforward is correct, Noah may have regarded this command to use an evergreen tree for the construction of the ark as somewhat appropriate. I think there are comments made by Peter in his epistles which give us an insight into how Noah would have, may have responded to this revelation from God, because they give us insights into the sorts of thinking that Noah had. <coughs> Noah, of course, is described as a preacher of righteousness. So he was one who witnessed to a society in which the wicked of, of man was great in the earth, and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually which is what it says in Genesis 6, verse 5. So he would be conscious that the spirit of rebellion introduced by Adam and Eve in Eden was rampant. And he would yearn, as a preacher of righteousness, he would yearn for the day when the seed of the woman would overcome the seed of the serpent and access to the tree of life would be restored. And we know that the ark he was to build prefigured the deliverance from the law of sin and death available through baptism into Christ as we're told in 1 Peter 3. And of course we also know from 2 Peter 3 that the flood that God told Noah he would send was a type of the judgement that God will pour out upon the nations when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to the earth. So I think it's possible that Noah may have seen in the specification of timber from an evergreen tree specifically for construction of the ark he may have seen reference not just to the salvation that that vessel would offer to his occupants, but more importantly, he would go beyond that and think of the ultimate deliverance available when access to the tree of life is restored. Now, this is our first example, and I can understand why you might be thinking, oh yeah, this is all a bit of a long bow. I hope to be able to show there's a pattern here that uh, perhaps makes this more likely. The first evidence Noah received that the judgment of the flood had passed was in fact from another evergreen tree. In this case, an olive leaf plucked by a dove, the dove that he sent out from the ark. And we read of that in Genesis 8 and verse 11. Genesis 8, verse 11. And the dove came into him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So no one knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. This is the first reference in the Bible to the olive tree, which of course is a, a common tree in the Bible. And the olive is a species known for being remarkably fruitful, long-lived and resilient, even in harsh conditions. Hence, of course, it's a major weed problem in this area, in the Adelaide Hills. It's remarkably fruitful, huge amounts of fruit, it's long-lived and resilient, even when it's harsh. Think of that in terms of the hope of life eternal. Later references in scripture to the olive suggest its link to this promise of life eternal. It was used for the cherubim in Solomon's temple. A direct link, of course, to the cherubim who kept the way of the tree of life. In a psalm that compares men who prefer wickedness over righteousness, David speaks of those who trust in the mercy of God forever and ever as being like a green olive tree in the house of God. A green olive tree in the house of God. When writing of the Kingdom Age, Hosea says that Israel's beauty shall be as the olive tree. And the Lord Jesus Christ, immediately prior to his arrest, trial and crucifixion, went where? to the Garden of Gethsemane. And Gethsemane means oil press. 
And there he sought strength from God for the trial ahead, which, what, which was, in effect, to restore access to the tree of life. And Paul likens the extension of the hope of Israel to the Gentiles in Romans to branches of wild olive being grafted into the good olive tree. And H. B. Tristram makes this observation about olive trees in, the, in his book, The Natural History of the Bible. To the Oriental, by which he means people who live in the Middle East, by the way, uh, just incidentally, for people who aren't familiar with some of these terms, we speak routinely of the Middle East. It's only a term of just over 100 years old in that context. It was created in the beginning of the 20th century. Prior to that, they talked to, they would frequently refer to that area as the Orient. As, and we would think of the Orient, of course, as Hong Kong or, or um, you know, Vietnam or somewhere, but not there. Tristan writing in the 19th century means Orient, he means Middle East, what we would now say Middle East. So you, if you've read older books, you might come across this unusual thing and wonder what they mean. So to the Oriental, the man who lives in the Middle East, the coolness of the pale blue foliage, its evergreen freshness, spread like a silver sea along the slopes of the hills, speaks of peace and plenty, food and gladness. The trunk too, gnarled and wrinkled, often hollow and scathed, yet yielding abundant crops to the extremest old age, and renewing itself from the inside, suggests the idea of perpetual youth. Very evocative language, isn't it? How many of those words pick up concepts that we would associate with the promise of access to the tree of life? And just as an aside, you may interest to know the oldest uh, living European tree in Australia is an olive tree, planted in the 1790s in uh, Elizabeth Farm in Sydney by the MacArthur's. And it still bears fruit, and it's still healthy. And of course, as someone who's been to the Holy Land and other parts of the world where olives are endemic, may well have seen olive trees that are reputed to be well over a thousand years old. The place of worship established at the east of the Garden of Eden, even if it had survived to Noah's day, and we don't, can't be sure, but even if it had, it obviously would have been washed away by the flood. Thus, when it was safe for Noah for, and his family to venture forth from the ark, his first recorded act is the building of an altar so that offerings would once again be made to God. We read of that in verses 20 and 21 of chapter 8. And in response to that faithful act, God renewed his promise that mercy would be extended to repentant sinners, a hope that was implicit in the promise made regarding Eve's seed in, in Genesis 3. <coughs> so moving on in Genesis, we come to Abram. And like, Abram, like Noah, Abram marks a new beginning in God's purpose. It's not surprising, therefore, that in his life there are parallels with the arrangements in the Garden of Eden. Abram was formed elsewhere and placed, Adam rather, was formed elsewhere and placed in the Garden, as we read in chapter 2. Abram also was formed elsewhere, in his case in Ur, and was placed in the land of promise, just as Adam had been placed in the Garden of Eden. So Abram is a new beginning. And although he was promised possession of that land in perpetuity, where he, of course, no, he was never given possession during his lifetime. He underwent a probation during which God tried him. And, of course, in Abraham's case, his faith was counted to him for righteousness. And to a remarkable degree, Abraham's life is intertwined with Sarah, as Adam's was with Eve. Now, of course, there are many married couples in the Bible, but... Sarah, or Sarah, plays a more prominent and more integrated role in the life of her husband than that of most wives. The text reveals several very positive aspects of their relationship, including, of course, the fact that she acknowledged the authority of Abraham. Sadly, though, there are also negative aspects in the relationship, which is only what we'd expect. And most notably, in terms of the parallels with the Garden of Eden, the fact that 
it says in Genesis 16 that Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai when she suggested he go into her maid Hagar to raise up a seed. The words used in Genesis 16 verse 2 are exactly the same as those used in Genesis 3.17 when God criticised Adam for listening to the words of Eve and taking the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Abram obeyed God's command, as we've read this, this evening in Genesis 12, to leave Haran and travel to the land that God said he would show him, which the record in Genesis 12 verse 5 identifies as Canaan. After an initial sojourn in Canaan, Abram and his camp relocated to Egypt before returning to Bethel a second time. <coughs> and on that occasion, the record makes the point in verse 7 of chapter 13, just have a quick look at that please, verse, chapter 13 and verse 7, when they come back to the land, it says in verse 7 of chapter 13, there was a strife between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelt then in the land. And that same point had been made in chapter 12 and verse 6, that the Canaanite was then in the land. Now, he'd been told to go to Canaan. So it would not be much of a surprise to find that there were Canaanites there. So this would appear to be redundant information, rather superfluous information. It's axiomatic that if you're sent to Canaan, the people you find there might well be Canaanites. But God chooses to twice tell us the fact that they were there at the time of Abraham, Abram. And it would be superfluous except for the fact I suspect it's making a bigger point. That this, these races had the potential to be Abram's nemesis. And they're therefore equivalent to the seed of the serpent from the Eden experience. And I think we can see that Abram recognised parallels between his situation and that of Adam's in the Garden of Eden, because trees play a particularly important part in his life and throughout his sojourn in the land. And I think these trees are an expression of his yearning for the restoration of access to the tree of life. We see the first case in chapter, in chapter 12 and verse 6. Abram passed through the land under the... I'll read it from the revised version. Abram passed through the land under the place of Shechem, unto the oak of Moray, and the Canaanite was in the land. The Hebrew word rendered plain in the authorised version should in fact be oak. It is the Hebrew word Elon, which is one of six related words which appear to be used indiscriminately and interchangeably to refer to oaks or similar large, robust trees, such as the terebinth or the turpentine tree. It would appear that five of these words refer specifically to one or more of the acorn-bearing oaks. Now, some scholars have attempted to align specific Hebrew words, one of those six specific Hebrew words, to a specific species of oak. But if you ch check those experts, their conclusions are inconsistent and their uh, application of the words are inconsistent. So it's unlikely that precision in that, expect, in that respect can be achieved. And in addition, as we see there at the bottom of the screen, uh, one botanist has made the point that botanical classification of oaks is very difficult and few taxonomists agree on how it should be done or which name should be used. And we have the same situation here in this country. The, the, uh, we talk about gum trees, but there's angophoras and eucalyptus and a couple of other species that are caught up in that more general phrase. And indeed, even individual species of gum, of eucalypt, have different names in different parts of the country. So we're not, this is not an unusual problem, but the oak tree is a particularly difficult uh, class of trees to, to specify for some, for some reason. So it's impossible, therefore, to be definitive as to which species of oak tree, or similar tree, is being referred to here. But we know that several of the oak species found in, in Israel, in fact the majority of them, are evergreen oaks, which are also incidentally referred to as live oaks. Now, I think when we think of an oak tree, we think, tend to think of the English oak, which of course sheds its leaves in autumn, 
or the pin oak, but in fact there are more oak species that are not deciduous, and particularly the ones in the land, in the holy land. And being evergreen, I think again may well have suggested to the men of those times a link with the tree of life, the trees that survive and don't, don't and live on and on. Now oak trees are renowned for being sturdy, for de being deep rooted, for being resilient and very long lived. And even when an oak tree does reach senescence, or when it's cut down, it can renew itself by sprouting from the stump or the roots. And in time, those new shoots may develop into a strong tree. You know, it's recorded that many centuries after all the oaks in the area had been cut down, people living around Bethlehem, this is centuries after they'd been cut down, people living in Bethlehem would dig up the roots that remained in the ground after all those years and use them for fuel. So durable was the timber that it would last buried in the ground for hundreds of years. Those facts, which would have been well known to people dependent on the land for their livelihood, in ways perhaps we're not, may well have evoked in them thoughts of the tree of life, quite separately from the fact that the tree was an evergreen. And that there was a tree that could be identified as the oak of Moray at Shechem, suggested it was both large and therefore quite old, and probably culturally significant because of its association with Moray. But was Moray a place, or a person, or a class of people? It's difficult to be certain. The text says that Abram was at Shechem, though. So I think we can presume that the name Moray is more likely to be applicable to a person or group of people rather than a place, because we're already told where the place is. It's Shechem. So who or what was Moray? Moray is, a, is the participle of the Hebrew word hora, which means to give spiritual direction. It's used, that word, in fact, is used in Isaiah 9 and verse 15. It's related to the word Torah. And Torah is the Hebrew word that refers to the first five books of the Bible. So the word, therefore, indicates a teacher, one who gives instruction, spiritual instruction. Now, Moray may have been an individual Canaanite who was recognised as a prophet or a teacher. Alternatively, Moray may refer to a group or order of teachers or prophets who acted as priests or oracles at Shechem, perhaps a little bit like Melchizedek at Salem, and perhaps over several generations, and who correctively were known by the name Moray. Whatever, Abram chose to make his camp at that sacred place. And while there, he was given the second of the promises that were made to him in verse 7. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land, and there builded he an altar unto the Lord, who appeared unto him. Did Abram go to Shechem because of the teacher or teachers that were known to live there? Were they like Melchizedek? Worshippers of the, wise, the Most High God in the land of Canaan. We cannot be certain, of course, but perhaps they preserved and were imparting knowledge about the way of the tree of life. Alternatively, given the passage of time since Noah and the tendency for the truth of the gospel to become corrupted over time, perhaps they may have been apostate spiritual leaders, honoured by the local Canaanites to whom they gave religious instruction. Verse 7 is the first time that Abram was promised a seed, and it's the first time that he was promised possession of the land of Canaan. And in response, underlining the religious significance of the site, Abram built an altar unto Yahweh. He was following Adam's example of worshipping at an altar associated with a sacred tree. Now, if that were not so, 
Why even mention the yoke of Moray? Why is it even mentioned if it's not meant to tell us something relevant to the record and to our understanding of what's going on? It's not just there's a bit of local colour to help us visualise the image of this place with a tree next to it. Surely it's there for a reason. Now, if Moray was a true worshipper of God, like Melchizedek, the altar may have been intended to reaffirm that the way of the tree of life, as taught by Moray, required sacrifice on the part of those who would be reconciled with God, just as we saw in the lesson that Abel and Cain and Abel learnt or didn't learn in Genesis 4. If, on the other hand, Moray was teaching error, then construction of an altar immediately adjacent to that oak tree may have been a deliberate statement that the teaching of Moray was to be rejected for the true way of the tree of life. Abraham, after all, had just been promised possession of this land. It would be appropriate then that he was keen to make clear to the inhabitants of the land the way of the tree of life. I'd like you to come across now, please, to Deuteronomy chapter 11. I think it's significant that the Oak of Moray is named here in Deuteronomy 11 verse 30 as the site where the Israelites were to gather to recite the law and to dedicate themselves to faithful service immediately after the nation had entered the Promised Land. We read of this in We read of this in Deuteronomy 11 and verse 30. Deuteronomy 11, verse 30. And they, yeah, sorry. Well, read verse 29. And it shall come to pass, when the Lord thy God hath brought thee in unto the land whither thou goest to possess it, that thou shalt put the blessing upon Mount Gerizim and the curse upon Mount Gebel. And they, are they not on the borders on the other side Jordan, by the way where the sun goeth down, in the land of the Canaanites, which dwell in the Champagne, the Arabah, over against Gilgal, beside the revised version, the Oaks of Moray, the Oak of Moray. There's our reference to the Oak of Moray again as the place where they were to, were to rededicate themselves to God's service. And it's surely here an implicit reminder of the promise made in Genesis 12 and the need to walk in the way of the Tree of Life. It's also, surely, an implicit impl repudiation of the gods of Canaan, of the Canaanites. And in our next class, in two weeks' time, we'll see that later on in Genesis, Jacob also re re repudiated the false gods of the Canaanites at this same place. Now, I'd like you to come across, please, to the book of Joshua. Shechem is prominent in the record of Joshua, in ways which are evocative of what is recorded in Genesis. In chapter 20, it was a city of refuge, which of course was a sanctuary for those who might otherwise be put to death following accidental manslaughter. And of course the whole law of the, of the cities of refuge is rich with allusions to the Lord Jesus Christ and his atoning work, aren't, isn't it? It was also, of course, a Levitical city. We're told that specifically in chapter 21, reflecting, curiously, its history as a centre of religious instruction in the way of the Tree of Life, going right back to Genesis. But most importantly in Joshua, it was the place to which Joshua summoned Israel in accordance with the commandment from Deuteronomy 11 for the rededication of the nation to God's service prior to his death. In Joshua 24, verse 1, we read that the nation presented themselves before God at Shechem. Presented themselves before God. Just as Adam and his family would have done before the cherubim, keeping the way of the tree of life. And at the end of this ceremony, in Joshua 24, there are words which take us back to Genesis 12 and even further back to the Garden of Eden, verse 24 to 26, Joshua 24. 
Joshua 24, verse 24. And the people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God will we serve, and his voice will we obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and set them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God and took a great stone and set it up there under an oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. An oak at Shechem. This oak must surely be the tree beside which Abram made his altar when first promised the land. Yes, I know it's more than 400 years later, well over 400 years later, but oaks are very long-lived trees, very long-lived trees, especially in that climate. And now the Israelites have taken possession of the land, promised to whom? To Abraham in Genesis 12. And Joshua chooses this site to remind Israel of the need to obey the commandments of God and walk in his ways, the way of the tree of life. And three times in this chapter, the people commit to serving God. That's in verses 16 to 18, and verse 21, and the third time in verse 24. And in verse 24, they also promise to hearken to God's voice. Who had Adam hearkened to? Not to God, but to Eve and he'd been expelled from the garden. And Israel would likewise be expelled from the land when they failed to hearken to the voice of God. And in verse 16, sorry, um, it's being by the sanctuary, um, verse 26, I'm sorry, uh, this oak is, referred to as being by the sanctuary of the Lord. The oak is by the sanctuary of the Lord. <coughs> Was this the remains of the place of teaching that had been there in Abram's day? Maybe. Or maybe it was the, the tabernacle that had been erected there for the ceremony. It's hard to be certain. But what is clear that this oak remained a significant religious site for Israel centuries after Abram first worshipped in the land. And Joshua added to its significance by setting up a great stone to witness to the covenant made by the people. In verse 27, Joshua said unto all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto us, for it hath heard all the words of the Lord which he spake unto us. It shall, therefore, it shall be therefore a witness unto you, lest ye deny your God. Come across now, please, to Josh, uh, Judges chapter 9. Some 200 years later, the oak tree at Shechem is again associated with events in the history of Israel. At that time, it's the place where Abimelech is made king. Judges 9 and verse 6. And all the men of Shechem gathered together and all the house of Milo and went and made Abimelech king by the revised version again, oak of the pillar that was in Shechem. It's that word Elon again. So we're back at Shechem and we're back at an oak tree, back at a pillar now, which takes us back to Joshua 24. Judges 9 verse 4 speaks of the house of Baal Bereth, which means the Lord of the Covenant, while verse 46 of Judges 9 refers to the house of the god Bereth, which is really Ael Bereth, so the god of Bereth, if you like, god of the Covenant. Makes Verse 46 makes it sound like it's a pagan god named Beareth, but it's Aeol Beareth, the house of the god of the covenant. In those names, then, there's no doubt a vestige of their awareness of the covenant made in Josh Joshua 24 and indeed with Abraham many years before. And the pillar in the phrase in verse 6, oak of the pillar, I think refers to the stone set up by Joshua and the covenant that had been made so many centuries earlier with Abram. Two centuries had passed since Israel before Joshua at Shechem, next to this oak, had committed to serving God. 
In those two centuries, they failed to live up to the covenant they made at that time. They did, however, remember that it was a significant place in Israel's history. And Abimelech played on the heritage of Shechem, clever politician, and he played on the emotions and the heritage of this place. When he beguiled the men of that place to make him their king. And I'm sure you're familiar with the record, he was immediately challenged by his half-brother Jotham, who also was conscious of the history of the area, because he ascended nearby Mount Gerizim, which of course had featured in the ceremony <coughs> to which Israel committed itself to God's service after entering the land. And why Gerizim? Because that was the Mount of Blessing. <coughs> and he uses that as the place where he condemned Abimelech and his supporters. So these people are playing right back into Israel's history because these people even knew their history. These things had been written and recorded in ways that they lodged and they remembered them. And so Jotham and, his, and Abimelech could both draw upon <coughs> that awareness in man, mounting their campaigns. And Jotham delivers a parable. It is, in fact, the first parable in the Bible, incidentally. And in that parable, he attacks Abimelech. But he also harkens back to the past. It's a parable based on trees, I think triggered by the rebels' misuse of the oak tree in verse 6. And in his parable, Jotham spoke of four plants which are said to abound in that area of the land around Shechem in Samaria. The olive, fig, vine, and what's referred to in at least the Orthodox version as the bramble. All of those plants produce edible fruit. And at times, the first three of them, the olive, fig and vine, are plants that are used as symbols for Israel. All of them would have been among the trees provided for Adam and Eve's benefit in the Garden of Eden. So we'll read that parable in verse, from verse 7. When they told it to Jotham, he went and stood in the top of Mount Gerizim and lifted up his voice and cried and said unto them, Hearken unto me, ye men of Shechem, and that God may hearken unto you. The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. And they said unto the olive tree, Reign thou over us. But the olive tree said unto them, Shall I leave my fatness wherewith by me they honour God and man and go to be promoted over the trees? And the tree said to the fig tree, Come thou and reign over us. But the fig tree said unto them, Should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit and go to be promoted over the trees? Then said the trees unto the vine, Come thou and reign over us. And the vine said unto them, Should I leave my wine which cheereth God and man and go to be promoted over the trees? Then said all the trees unto the bramble, Come thou and reign over us. And the bramble said unto the trees, If in truth ye anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow, and if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. It's a remarkable parable, of course. And Jotham drew attention to the way in which the first three trees sustain and enhance our life, highlighting how they offer fatness. The Hebrew has the idea of abundance. We think of the word fatness as right in a negative context, but for the Hebrews it was a, the idea of abundance. Of sweetness and of wine, which cheereth God and man. And the Hebrew word there for wine in that verse signifies freshly squeezed grape juice. And it's only very rarely used for fermented grape juice. So all lovely products. The bramble is different. Its fruit is edible, absolutely it's edible, but it's not especially tasty, nor is it highly regarded, especially in comparison to olives, figs and grapes. And in the parable you would have noticed the modesty of the olive and the fig and the grapes are contrasted with the haughtiness of the bramble and the arrogance of the bramble. Now, some authorities, following the translation of the Septuagint and of the Vulgate, identify the bramble in this paragraph, parable with a type of low, thorny shrub, Lycium europeum, which is found in the land and is used sometimes as a hedge, a low, spiky plant you'd well imagine might be effective as a hedge around, say, a vegetable garden or something. 
I think that's inappropriate, however, for this parable. A little, low, spiky bush is not what's being referred to here. It's a parable about trees, and in verse 15 it's, he boasts about his shade, doesn't he? Well, a low, spiky bush doesn't produce a lot of shade. The Hebrew word translated bramble is, is attard, and it's now generally <coughs> accepted and recognised that it refers to a large, thorny tree called Zisiphus spina Christi, which grows through much of the land. It's very common. It's a hardy, vigorous tree. It can develop into a massive tree over time. And one Israeli botanist says this about the Zisiphus spina Christi. This is a modern Israeli botanist. When the atad, the Zisiphus spina Christi, is left to grow unimpeded, it develops a wide and wild look. Its foliage made up of clumps that seem to hang in the air. The atad is larger than all the other fruit trees native to Israel and casts a wide and heavy shade beneath its boughs. A single full-grown atad in a wheat field serves as a cool resting place during harvest time for those working in the field and on the threshing floor, while in grazing areas it offers respite from the sun for shepherds and their flocks. Though the atad is beneficial in many ways to shepherds and wheat harvesters, this tree is known to be harmful to fruit trees. It is a strong tree whose roots spread in a wide circle and compete with the roots of other trees with a vigour that fruit trees cannot rival. Well, I think those characteristics of the Atad suggest why Jotham employed it in his parable. As a tree, it is very much a mixed blessing. A tough, prickly tree that outcompetes its rivals is surely an appropriate metaphor for Abimelech. The Hebrew name Atad is derived from a root meaning to pierce, and the Atad is notoriously thorny. thorny. Notoriously so. Both the wood and the thorns were considered excellent kindling. The thorns are very large, by the way. The wood and the thorns were considered excellent kindling. And that had is in fact a Hebrew noun for those thorns that are spoken of in Psalm 58 under the pot that helps it to boil. And hence you have in the, in the parable this reference to its devouring combustibility in verses 15 and 20. Again, in chapter 9 and verse 20, we see that idea of how it could devour things with its flames. Indeed, in the parable, even the noblest tree of the land, the cedar, could be destroyed by a fire from these branches. In these respects, I think Adet, Adet, the Atad typifies the destructive impact of the curse on the land imposed following Adam's transgression, which specifically is spoken about in Genesis 3 verse 18 as a time when thorns would proliferate. Was Jotham deliberately linking Abimelech with the beguiling of the serpent and the curse imposed when Adam and Eve followed his thinking? Now again, you might say, well, you know, it's a pretty long bow, just to pick up the thorns and say this takes you back to Genesis and therefore he's going back to the curse. But as we read on, we might see that there's more to it than just that. And I also think Abimelech, as the target of the parable, recognised where Jotham's thoughts were taking him and the people he was speaking to, all the way back to Genesis 3. <coughs> Jotham was doing that, he knew his hearers would do it, he, and Abimelech recognised it too, as we'll see. Three years after the installation of Abimelech, Abimelech as ruler, a man named Gael led a rebellion against him. And when Abimelech sent forces against, against him, Gael spoke of a company of men approaching by the way of the oak of Meonemon. We read that in verse 37 of Judges 9. Gael spoke again and said, See, there come people down by the middle of the land, and another company come along by, again the authorised version, the oak of Meonemon. Again, it's that Elon word, which is really the oak, not the plain, as the authorised version has. 
Leo Neiman is not a place name, I think. It's a Hebrew word which relates to augury or sorcery. Coverdale very quaintly translates the phrase as the witch oak, while Tristram offers oak grove of the magicians. Now, of course, you recall that Israel was told to have nothing to do with such practices in Deuteronomy 18. And we know that Manasseh was one who ignored that prohibition. But they weren't to be involved with these people, these magicians or uh, sorcerers. The ESV renders this as the diviner's oak. Diviners, as in, you know, someone who divines the, the will of God or the will of a God. The diviner's oak. So was this diviner's oak the same tree as the teacher's oak in Genesis 12 and the oak in Joshua 24 and the oak in verse 6? I think it's quite possible. And if so, we have an example of how memories of sacred events and sacred sites become corrupted over time. What Abraham had associated with the tree of life and with the ways of God and the way of the tree of life in Genesis 12 is now associated with soothsaying and the ways of men. And as one writer has observed about this, we see then how spiritual significance is not forgotten exactly, it is simply corrupted through negligence. It is not such a big step between the teacher's oak and the augur's oak. Whereas in the days of Abram and Joshua, this tree had been used as a fixed point proclaiming the true way of serving God, the men of Abimelech Shechem had corrupted its significance using its known historical associations to lend respectability to the basis corruptions of worship that Phoenician paganism could devise. Now you know, I'm sure from his Sunday school days, that Gael's rebellion was crushed by Abimelech. But his determination to root out opposition led to Abimelech's demise. Verse 46 to 48 of Judges 9. And when all the men of the Tower of Shechem heard that, they entered into a hold of the house of the god Bereth, or a house of Hayor Bereth. And it was told Abimelech that all the men of the Tower of Shechem were gathered together. And Abimelech got him up to Mount Zalmon, he and all the people that were with him, and Abimelech took an axe in his hand and cut down a bough from the trees and took it and laid it on his shoulder and said unto the people that were with him, What do you see me do? Make haste and do as I have done. So Abimelech rounds on the rebels in Shechem, who sought shelter in the house of the God of Bereth, the God of the Covenant, in verse 46, a place that should have been regarded as sacred. And Abimelech ignored the sanctity of this place and he went to Mount Zalmon, there's no known such place. The Hebrew name means shady, so it would appear to be a description rather than a place name. So it was a well-timbered location, some mountainside with lots of timber, lots of trees. And there they cut boughs, a word used only in this chapter, from trees that could be used to inseminate the rebels. So we're not getting much help to identify what these trees are here, are we? The word's only used here, and all we know it's a shady place. Were these boughs cut? That's the quote from my bill that I just read, which I didn't show you. <laughs> Sorry for that. Um, were these boughs cut uh, from an atad tree? The record doesn't say so, does it? But the atad is certainly very common in that part of the country. And it does produce branches low to the ground, which would be very readily accessible to Abimelech's men. And we know that the wood of the attard would have been ideal for this purpose. As it says there again, quoting that Israeli uh, botanist Havini, both the thin and thicker branches quickly catch fire and burn brightly, generating much heat and very little smoke. There is thus a natural association between the attard and consuming flames of fire. Now when Abimelech moves on to attack the men and women of Thebes, Abimelech again sought to incinerate those seeking refuge in a tower. Pick it up in verse 52. And Abimelech came unto the tower, at this time in Thebes, and fought against it and went hard unto the door of the tower to burn it with fire. And a certain woman cast a piece of a millstone upon Abimelech's head, 
and all to break his skull. Then he called hastily unto the young man, his armour bearer, and said unto him, Draw thy sword and slay me, that men say not of me, a woman slew him. And his young man thrust him through, and he died. <coughs> a woman inflicting a head injury on the beguiler of Israel. It's evocative, isn't it, of the promise in Genesis 3, verse 15, that the seed of the serpent will be bruised in the head by the seed of the woman. And Abimelech, I believe, recognised that association because even though he knew he was already fatally wounded, he sought, in verse 53, to obviate the link with the events in Eden. Look at verse 54. Then he called hastily unto the young man, his son bearer, and said unto him, Draw thy sword and slay, slay me, that men say not of me, a woman slew him. And his young man thrust him through and he died. He attempted to get rid of the association between his death and the role of the woman, but scripture thwarted him. Scripture thwarted him in that attempt to avoid the suggestion that he was slain by the seed of the woman. Because later in the scripture, when an allusion is made to this incident, it was not his armour bearer who's credited with his death. It says in 2 Samuel 11, we have it up there on the screen, Who smote Abimelech, the son of Jerobotheth? Did not a woman cast a piece of a millstone upon him from the wall that he died in Thebes? So, brothers and sisters, our time is gone. I'm sorry I've gone a bit over time. But in our next class, we'll return to Genesis and we'll look further at some interesting trees and allusions to the tree of life and the Garden of Eden that are found later in Genesis.